Our scripture reading today is Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. Listen for the word of God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take the Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. This is the word of the risen Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have given us the Psalms to speak to you. And multitudes of the faithful have used these words to pray to you, to sing our faith over the centuries. Help us this morning to understand Psalm 51. Help me to preach it. Help us all to listen and receive it. And by it, Lord, reach into our hearts and teach us more of who you are and how our relationship with you is so full of your grace. Amen. As you read the Psalms, uh, you'll notice that sometimes uh, you'll find a little small note, usually italicized, right before the first verse of the Psalm. Many of the Psalms come from particular times in David's life, and these notes, which are part of the original writing of the Psalms, often give the background to that Psalm, where it came from. And we find in Psalm 51 that it is a Psalm of David, and it says in that little note, italicized, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Well, we need to hear this, don't we? The story is found in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. David is uh, king of the nation, and his army is out fighting a war somewhere. And he is at home, because he's the king, and he's biding his time. And one day, as he's walking on the roof of his house, he sees down below a beautiful woman. Her name is Bathsheba. She is bathing on the roof of her house. She also happens to be the wife of one of King David's soldiers who's out to war. Succumbing to lust, 
abusing his power, David has her brought to him. And he lays with Bathsheba and she becomes pregnant. Figuring that he can fix this whole mess, David has Bathsheba's husband, whose name is Uriah, has Uriah called home from the war. That way it will look like Uriah is the father, and when news of Bathsheba's pregnancy becomes public, everything will make sense, right? But since loyal soldiers don't enjoy time with their wives when their comrades are back at the front, Uriah refuses to sleep with his wife. Frustrated, David sends Uriah back to the war and has the commander put him on the very front lines where the fighting is the fiercest because there's a good chance that Uriah will be killed. Sure enough, that's what happens. And the king thinks now he has solved the issue. King David has committed adultery. He's been responsible for the creation of a new life for which he refuses to take responsibility, and he tries to cover it all up by committing murder. I mean, that's bad. I mean, I don't know what your week was like or what you did that you think was bad, but I think this is pretty bad. And David thinks that no one will ever know. But the Lord knows. And the Lord sends the prophet Nathan to David. Now, Nathan was kind of David's spiritual advisor. And Nathan tells David a story. He says he has a story he wants to share with him about a rich man stealing the lamb of a poor man. A lamb that this poor man loved with all his heart. He, 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 he cuddled this poor lamb in his arms. It meant more than anything to him. And the rich man not only stole the lamb, but killed the object of the poor man's affection and served that lamb for a meal. And if you go back and read, I'm just kind of summarizing it. If you go back and read, it's just heartrending the way Nathan tells this story. And when David asks, and when Nathan asks David, what do you think should be done to that rich man, David? David is enraged. And he says, that man deserves to die, and he should repay that poor man four times over, because he had no pity on him. And Nathan delivers the punchline, and he says, David, you are that man. And David is stunned, and he is convicted to the heart. And that's the background of Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a psalm of confession. It's one of seven psalms that are called the penitential psalms because they express penitence, a desire to have God forgive. Psalm 51 begins, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And while these words originally come from an adulterer and a murderer and a liar, they're words for all of us. Psalm 51 helps us to pray for God's forgiveness whenever we are guilty of living against God. In the first three verses, there are three words used for failure before God. Transgressions, iniquity, and sin. Transgressions means to deliberately cross boundaries. Iniquity means to be crooked. And sin means to miss the mark. In the first three verses, there are three actions that David asks God to take. First, David prays for God to blot out his transgressions, which means to erase or to remove it from the record. Second, David prays for God to wash him, which speaks of his need for forgiveness from what is soiled and filthy in his life. And then third, he prays for God to cleanse him, which is related to blot out. In the prayer of the first three verses of this psalm, David asked God to do these things based on three qualities of God's character. God's mercy, 
God's unfailing love, and God's great compassion. And aren't we glad that our God is a God of mercy, a God of unfailing love, and a God of great compassion? And notice where David places the blame when you read this psalm fully on himself. He makes no excuses. He doesn't rationalize. He doesn't theologize. He doesn't spiritualize. He was wrong. And he wasn't just wrong toward Bathsheba and Uriah, as cruel as his actions toward them were. David was wrong toward God. Against you, he says, you only, God, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Verse 4. David's worst sin actually wasn't adultery. It wasn't murder. It wasn't even the cover-up. David's greatest sin was his disregard for the Lord and imagining that he could live his life without regard for the Lord. David's worst failure was thinking that he could pull a fast one on Almighty God. Now we might say, hey look, I haven't stolen anyone's spouse. I've never committed murder. I've never even gotten a parking ticket. I'm pretty good. I'm not a bad person. I'm not a sinner. Hey, sports fans, let me tell you. Anytime we supersede the Lord and think we can live free of Him in any way, that is sin. Sin is simply a violation of our relationship with God, and there is no one, no one who's free of that. We do it in big ways, we do it in little ways, and every Christian should mature to the point where we are able to look into our hearts and find whatever sin lies there. David not only prays for forgiveness in Psalm 51, but he also prays for God to change him. Uh, he prays for a restoration of what his rebellion against God took from him. He wants a restoration of joy and gladness. He asks for God not to take his Holy Spirit from him. He prays, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Because we need more than just a removal of what's bad in our lives. We need a filling up of what is good. We need renewal. We need restoration. We need redemption and righteousness. We need God to change our hearts and to give us a right spirit that can resist temptation and seeks to live in God's ways. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. That can be a daily prayer for all of us. That Hebrew word for create, the Hebrew word for create is bara. bara. Say that with me. Bara. See, you know Hebrew. <laughs> but here's the thing about that word. It means to bring into existence what was not there before. And in the Bible, it is only used in relation to God because only God can do this. You know, every Sunday we have a prayer of confession in our worship, don't we? Many churches do this every Sunday or regularly. We have a, this prayer of confession not because we need to be reminded of what losers we are. Uh, we don't do it to feel bad about ourselves. We do it to humble ourselves before God and acknowledge that we all fall short of the life that he calls us to. And we do it to allow God to heal us. Our prayer of confession is written for us to say together, but you and I can go to God with our own words, on our own, and ask for forgiveness any time. And I think when we confess, it keeps our hearts open to God. It keeps us spiritually healthy. It really does. And the prayer of confession and worship is always followed by the, what, assurance of forgiveness. Because we sin, we all sin, we have those dark parts of our lives, but that is not the final word about us, nor is it all the news about us. In light of Jesus Christ, there is good news, and that good news is that we are forgiven. 
That is the promise that God makes to us in His Son, Jesus Christ, who has come to bring the grace of God. I mean, listen to some of the promises, just some of the promises that we find in the New Testament. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, he says, Because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. In Romans 8, it says this, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? There is no condemnation. We are not condemned. We were unable to keep the law of God, so God sent His Son to be a sin offering, to die as our substitute on the cross. Our debt has been paid. At the end of Psalm 51, you'll notice David mentions sacrifices and burnt offerings. He says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. You see, in the Old Covenant, in the time of David, animal offerings were how the people of God received forgiveness under the Old Covenant. Uh, but David doesn't bring a sheep to sacrifice. He brings his own broken heart, knowing how he's offended God. And when we come with true sorrow for our sin and regret for what we've done, God sees that and He forgives that. And under the new covenant in Jesus Christ, our sin is forgiven by the once and for all sacrifice, not of an animal, but of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the only thing that God can't help is a heart that has no sorrow for its sin. We have this promise, one more in 1 John. It was our assurance of forgiveness today. I put it in there on purpose. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. No one can claim to be without sin, uh, yet pe many people run around and justify themselves even as they live against the ways of God. And sometimes that results in deep guilt in a person's soul. Their conscience burdens them. But God is faithful and just and will forgive the person who comes to Him honestly. He will forgive the person who is remorseful and He will purify us, it says, from all unrighteousness. Not some, all unrighteousness. Remember David's praise in Psalm 51 for God to cleanse him. Well, God's answer to David's prayer for cleansing and washing is Jesus Christ. Other people live in constant self-condemnation. They cannot believe that God's mercy is strong enough to handle the wrong that they've done. Maybe you say, oh, Phil, you don't know how bad I've been. You don't know what I've done. Well, maybe I don't. But I mean, can you top David's trifecta of adultery, murder, and cover-up? And maybe you can. I don't know. But even if you can match that, God knows where you failed. Trust in the cross of His Son to deal with your sin. Guilt plays right into the hands of Satan. He uses it to keep a wall between us and God so that we will not come to know God's powerful love for us. And Christ came to do away with the condemnation and to free us from that guilt. But you say, I keep asking for forgiveness over and over again, sometimes for the same things. Surely God's grace has a limit. Surely my allotment of forgiveness has been used up. Brothers and sisters, God's grace has no limit. His forgiveness cannot be used up. We keep coming and coming and coming, and God keeps showing mercy and grace and love. There is a verse in Romans that says, Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Our Lord Jesus came not because we could be right with God on our own. We can't. 
He came because every person who has ever lived falls short of God's standards. He came in love. He came to do what we could not do for ourselves. You know, Jesus told a parable one time about a Pharisee and a tax collector. Maybe you remember that. And they both come to the house of God to pray. And the Pharisee was very sure that he was good before God, that he had done all, everything right. And his prayer was that he was glad that he was not like this, Pharisee, uh, this tax collector over here. Glad I'm not like him. All the bad things he's done. The tax collector, it says, he, he wouldn't even come near the front of the sanctuary. He just stood way in the back, probably felt rotten about himself, rotten about the things he was doing. And his prayer was simply this, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, just be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says this, he says, it was the tax collector who went back to his house, right with God, justified. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That is Psalm 51 in a nutshell, in brief. We all fail. We can all be hypocrites. We can all do things in the dark that no one else sees. We can speak the hurting word. We can do the wrong thing. We cannot do the right thing that we should do. And Psalm 51 is a prayer, a song to bring to God when our hearts are heavy and weighed down with sin. Psalm 51 is there when we have blown it. Psalm 51 is there so that God can bring healing where we need it most. So take it, read it, pray it, and know as sure as he did for David that God will meet us in his great mercy.